when the day of Pentecost had come. They were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven, the rush of a violent wind, Luke says there at the beginning of Acts. The Holy Spirit filled the place where they were together and sent them out boldly with a renewed sense of God's presence among them. It is so special to be together for worship this Sunday of Pentecost. Whether you have worshiped with us in person or online for many years or are newer to our community, your presence is a gift. In addition to my dear colleagues, I'm grateful for Rachel and Tina and Muff for their worship leadership, for our great choir, a wonderful team on screen and behind it as we piece all this together. There are a pile of uh, announcements in the bulletin and the newsletter online that I hope you'll spend time with. It's a full and important time and there's much to share. There'll be a meeting of the congregation on Zoom after our 11 o'clock worship service. So after worship today, uh, so you can click right over and click that Zoom link. Check today's bulletin or newsletter for it to get connected. The nominated committee will present a report on the church's 2024, kind of amazing to say, class of elders and deacons. They've submitted bios and we'll have all those pieces together. The meeting won't take long, but it's important that we approve our next season of leadership for the church. Many of us gathered on campus yesterday afternoon um, and on Thursday evening as well to bid farewell and best wishes to Kathy Stickley. Um, our beloved preschool director who has served with our preschool for more than 35 years. Uh, there's still a couple, a couple of opportunities, even if you missed those, to connect with Kathy before she retired. You can send her a card or make a donation to the Kathy Stickley Scholarship Fund. You can mail it to the church and we'll figure it out. As she moves into her final week this week, we thank God for her ministry among us. We pray God's blessings on the next season, more time with family and relaxing the, at the beach and enjoying her relatively new grandson. Earlier this morning, we gathered our Christian education leaders out on the terrace to offer our thanks for keeping us connected and learning and growing in faith in a challenging year. So many of you have helped lead a church school class or confirmation or a midweek study, um, keeping us connected and nurturing the promises made at baptism as we listen and learn together is a big deal, and I'm really grateful to you. We'll be hosting soon a training for Godly Play, which is a special program we offer for our young children during the 11 o'clock in-person worship services from September to May. It's a way to gather around the story and listen for God. Being a leader in this is not only wonderful for our children, but will also help nurture your spiritual life as well. If you'd like to learn more, please contact Marita. I also want to personally invite you to join me at my virtual table at this spring celebration breakfast for Housing for New Hope on Tuesday, June the 8th from 10 to 11. Um, Housing for New Hope started in Westminster's copy room. Um, it has been building affordable housing and caring for our neighbors and neighbors in Durham for 35 years. Send me an email and I'd love to connect you for that opportunity. There's a lot going on as we prep for live streaming in June and welcome you back in here with us. Um, look for more word on that coming this week. And another quick note um, for past, on pastoral care. On some saints of the church, we recorded the prayers earlier in the week, and I'm a little later, but it gives me a chance to invite you um, to pray for the families of some dear saints. You received an email from me about Brother Bill Copridge, um, who died last Sunday, and his service and burial was on Friday. Um, I received a note Thursday morning from their pastor in Northern Virginia that Ann Dancy died Wednesday night. Um, John and Ann Dancy were wonderful members here for over a decade and moved to be near family a couple of years ago. Both have been in poor health. I also spoke on Thursday with the son of Dee Dee Clover. Again, Phil and Dee Dee were members here for a long time. Right there, I see where they sat. Um, and Dee Dee moved to New Jersey to be near her family a few years ago when Phil died. Um, Dee Dee's health has declined and she's now in hospice care. So many saints and their families covet your prayers. Okay. Friends, now take a moment and kind of settle your body. Breathe in that spirit of Pentecost, God's love for all, for you. Friends, the Lord be with you and also with you. Let us together worship God. Oh, 
Please join me in the call to worship using the words displayed on the screen and in today's bulletin. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. When you hide your face, your creation is dismayed. When you take away our breath, we die and return to dust. I will sing the praise to my God while I have being. When you send forth your spirit, life is created. Each day you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May all creation rejoice in the works of our God. Dear friends, why do we confess our sin? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But why do we do this together? Because we are a community, a covenant people. Then let us confess our sin. For the things we have done that harmed your creation, for the things we have done that harmed other people, for all that we have done, and all that we have failed to do. We ask for your mercy. We pray for your forgiveness. For when we have ignored our neighbors, for when we have ignored you, for when we have ignored the image of God that you plant within us all, we ask for your mercy. 
we pray for your forgiveness. Teach us to forgive that we may be forgiven. Teach us to do the work of justice. Teach us to love kindness and teach us to walk humbly beside you. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer, we pray. Amen. Dear friends, hear this very good news. Who is in a power to condemn? Only God, the one who made us, the one who came to earth to live by us because God is the one who loves us. Christ is praying for us even now, even this morning. And I declare to you this day, in the name of our Lord and Savior, that we are forgiven of all our sins. Thanks be to God. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, Good morning, I'm Muffer Bannock, a Sunday school teacher here at Westminster. I am now in my 42nd straight year of teaching pre-K and kindergarten, and I'd like to share with you this part of my faith journey. I started teaching Sunday school here at Westminster when we were very new, and our daughter was in kindergarten here. One of her teachers moved away, and I was asked to fill in and be a teacher. Well, at first I was really hesitant. I was nervous. I had no experience teaching young children. But after prayerful consideration and knowing my love of young children, and that also this was a way I might be able to serve, I said yes. And I have been teaching ever since. I have absolutely loved teaching our church's young children about God's and Jesus' love for them and for all people. Bringing Bible stories to life for this aged child has just been so much fun, uh, teaching them that God wants them to be kind and to love one another and to help others and also teaching them, these stories teach them that God and Jesus are always with them. This has been a true blessing for me and has strengthened my own faith. It has been fun and pure joy for me to teach so many of Westminster's young children and to them watch them grow up, watch them being confirmed, participating in youth group and in the Youth Sunday worship service, and in missions. I encourage you to consider teaching Sunday school at Westminster. Believe me, the rewards are plentiful. Maybe you have a favorite age, like pre-K, kindergarten, or lower school, middle school, high school, or even adults. It's a tremendous, tremendous 
way to serve and to be involved in the church. What's great about teaching here at Westminster is you don't have to have any experience. You don't have to do it alone. You have a team of teachers, as I have had since I began, church members like Cindy Deal, Margaret Jones, and Karen Stallings, to name a few. And for the past 28 years, Julie Hardison and Helen Therrington and I have been teaching together. What a team. And you don't have to create your own curriculum because the church has that for you. We have an amazing director of Christian education, Marita Winans, who is available to guide, help, and advise teachers. And we have a strong Christian education committee to help and support Marita and all of us. They and Marita, as well as many others, made it possible for all of us to teach during COVID. That was a wonderful, wonderful for me personally. Teaching Church School is a wonderful way to connect with other members of the church, with families, pastors, and staff. It's a way to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer of the word. I hope some of you will feel called to teach as I was long ago. Thank you. Good morning, young Christians. Today is Pentecost, when we remember how God gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit so we can do and say the wonderful things that Jesus did. The Spirit has given each of us a special way of serving others. But I wonder what would happen if everyone thought that their gift was the very best. Let's hear a story. It isn't a Bible story. It's a type of storytelling that our Jewish sisters and brothers have given us. It's called Midrash, which imagines what might have happened in between the stories of the Bible. This story is called A Very Big Problem, and it was written by Amy Jill Levine and Sandy Eisenberg Sasso and illustrated by Annie Bowler. God planted the very first garden in the whole world. You might think it was a quiet and peaceful place, but it wasn't. There was a problem, a very big problem. Each part of the garden was sure it was the best, the most important, the one God loved more than any other. They all bragged and boasted and blustered. Land said, God made me first. I was here before any of you. Without me, there would be no garden, no place for seeds, nothing for roots or vegetables to grow or flowers to bloom. I am the first. Land quaked. God should love me the most. It is only fair. Rain spluttered. No way is that fair. Without me, nothing could grow. What good is land without rain? Nothing more than dusty dirt. I am the most refreshing. Rain drizzles. God should love me the most. It is only fair. Plants sprouted. No way is that fair. We may have come after land and rain, but what is a garden without us? Just an empty field, no bright colors, no sweet scents, no soft grass. We are the most beautiful. Plants bloomed. God should love us the most. It is only fair. Well, you can guess what comes next. The sun, the birds, the earthworms, the quadrupeds, all those four-legged creatures and critters. 
And then children came along. No fair, no fair, no fair. No way is that fair. Without us, there is no one to take care for the garden. We till it and feed it and rake it and weed it. You all may have been created before us, but we are the most important. We are the best of creation, the very best. The children cried, God should love us the most. It is only fair. God listened to lane, land and rain, plants and sun, birds and earthworms, quadrupeds and children, and smiled. Then God said, Some of you came before others. Some of you are bigger and some of you are stronger. Some sing and some growl. Some wiggle and some thump. But, but, all of you are needed. My love is big enough for every one of you. Without all of you together, there would be no garden at all. Everyone listened to what God said. They stopped arguing. They stopped bragging and boasting and blustering. In one raucous chorus, they sang out, God's garden needs every one of us. God loves us all. Then they all drew a deep breath and sighed one very big, ah. There was quiet in God's garden. There was peace. And it was very good. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for giving each of us gifts. We are all needed, and we are all loved because your love is big enough for every one of us. Amen. As we approach God's word, let us pray for the Spirit to illumine our hearts and minds. Spirit of power, Spirit of truth. You broke in among those disciples at Pentecost and changed the world. Inspire us with that same hope. Transform us by your love. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And it suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Eliamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea, and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. 
Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of, of every single one of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. The old Robert Frost poem says that sends the ground, the frozen groundswell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps that even two can pass abreast. He continues, Frost does, describing the moment each spring when our narrator and his neighbor walked on opposite sides, they walked down their fence line, checking things, making repairs, shifting rocks back into place, closing gaps in the gate. They walk and they check. And his neighbor keeps coming back to this one line. He keeps repeating it. He keeps saying, good fences make good neighbors. And our narrator again wonders why at one point. Do, do good fences make good neighbors? Must they be in place between us? And his neighbor another nod as they walk. Good fences make good neighbors. And while there's something in me that wants to, 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 to push back, my mind goes too quickly to walls, walls on the U.S.-Mexico border, walls in Israel-Palestine, sites of, of contention and loss, symbols of exclusion and power. But there's also something in all of us that likes to keep things in their place, have some sort of predictable rhythm. We collaborated with our, our, own, our neighbors at our house recently to redo a fence in between our yards because in some way it's nice not to sit on our porch and look directly into their porch as much as we like them. They don't need to deal with our chaos and noise and poorly behaved puppy. It is not entirely bad to know where my yard ends and his begins. Knowing the boundary means I do my part on my side, you do your part on yours, and we know kind of the turf where collaboration is needed. But there's also, a, a, I think, a psychological security we crave. These walls and fences become metaphor. We like to know our lives are in place, that things are solid and predictable. Change is really hard, and much of the day we all spend adapting and managing the schedule and the change around it. What did we think we had to do, and what, what do we have to do actually now? It surely extends throughout this pandemic. Right after the exhaustion of adapting last spring, there have been seasons where we've had to kind of dial up or dial down, but adapt we have. And while those of us with the privilege of flexibility and some economic security sure are glad to see our family and friends more as conditions improve and vaccinations increase, I do have some worry about the days ahead. At least in lockdown, I knew what to do. And now in the in-between, in between this online and in-person world, as we're kind of fumbling into things together, I'm less sure. I read an article last week about something called cave syndrome, psychologists call it, where people who've been vaccinated still won't go out, even though, the, even though the risks are really steadily decreasing. Their anxiety and fear grip them, which is scary and it's hard. But also wonder, too, in addition to that, like real depression and anxiety and the mental health toll, which is overwhelming, but also wonder if as much as we've stayed home, part of us has gotten content. It is an ideal, but there is some predictability. Once we leave those walls, once life and work and family and school and commitments to church or anywhere else, all these things come back more and more. There's a whole lot up in the air that we have to figure out what to do with. 
It's easy to see. Even as really hard as it was to look back on those walls that kept us in, kept us safe with some fondness. We had enough time to make friends with them. Those walls and fences were good enough neighbors. They knew us, and we knew them. At least we knew what to expect. Later on, later on, the CDC shift on masks, and, I, and I've wrestled. I suspect you have too. There are sets of questions about children and immune compromised folks, about policy and about care. But then there's also my own fear. At least I knew what to do before. And I'm pretty darn sure I don't know now. Can you imagine those disciples? The uncertainty that gripped them after all they had been through, all of it from the blur of the years before, and then Jesus, that that, that fateful week riding a donkey into Jerusalem with the political and religious leaders watching from up high, the city in turmoil as Jesus turned the tables over in the temple as he taught and preached, tension building as they gathered around the table and the arrest in the garden, beatings, Crucifixion, his awful death, exhaustion, and loss. And then he was alive, which was great, but what in the world did that mean, they wondered. As Acts begins, our author Luke reaches back to the ascension, and they meet, and they add Matthias to the team, as we talked about last week, and then the disciples gather, and they wait. And then today's text. Suddenly... The rushing of a violent wind filling the house, tongues of fire on each of them and beyond them all around, the fi- filling the place with the Holy, and them with the Holy Spirit, the one they had just been promised. And then they begin to speak in languages they didn't know before, and they rushed out of the house, Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. Luke tells us from all over the place for the festival of Pentecost, pilgrims from everywhere, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, 15 nations listed symbolic of the whole world gathered there. And all of these people from all of the known world knew something was happening. These people rushing around, the crowds were amazed and perplexed, sensing, sensing something big was going on. They felt it in their bones. Others, they're always detractors, right, sneered. They're drunk. They're filled with new wine, the text says. Those people are ridiculous. And Peter has an answer for them, a sermon that's bold and strong, very characteristic of Peter. He jokes, it's too early to be drunk, and then turns to the prophet Joel. In those days, he brings them up alongside to a promise, a promise of visions and dreams for all people that God's glorious future will break in, and there will be no mistaking it. Everything will change, signs from above and below, and turmoil and change, and God will show up. Peter says, God will show up. I don't know about you, but I was feeling fairly anxious and overwhelmed by all of the things, and that was before a couple of weeks ago, right? First, a rush of joy and relief. I sat at my kitchen table and watched the breaking news that 12 to 15-year-olds would be able to get a vaccine, and I was texting with our extraordinary pediatrician and shed a few tears. Maybe we can, maybe we'll be able to glimpse the other side of this thing after all. Maybe, maybe we'll get there. And then not long after the CDC, then the state of North Carolina made some pretty big shifts in guidance and I don't begrudge them at all for doing so. Fundamentally, I'm grateful for it, but I felt like a lot in a different kind of way. Maybe a little too much too fast, but then I knew I was supposed to be excited because it meant progress, but heck, I haven't known what I'm supposed to do for at least 16 months, and probably longer than that, but that's a different talk anyway. Who knows? And I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody who isn't pretty wiped out right now. Exhausted. We're all beginning to make plans to see people we love, which is great. But then with that comes the complexity of learning how to be together again all over the place. But it also sets kind of in play another kind of series of cascading complexities with 
learning how to be together all, all over the place. But again, with who's, who's doing what with whom and who isn't and who's included and who is left out. And you really enjoy them and you forget you didn't really like them that much. But they're good friends with someone you enjoy and people and families and kids. And I don't, again, I don't know anybody who isn't dealing with some pretty serious family stuff along with their own exhaustion even among relatively privileged folks like us. The strain is so real. Brother Bill Copperidge, a charter member of this church, died on Sunday night. Suddenly more loss in our circles after that and to come. And we all have all sorts of COVID adapting in the works here at the church and and everywhere else in the world, which will roll out soon. And School is kind of stumbling towards a conclusion, and then everybody will really have nothing to do, but all the other pressures remain, layers and layers of grief all over our land and neighbors. You make your own list far beyond anything I've said. It's a lot to hold. A pandemic of grief, Dana Trent called it at the really wonderful aperture last Wednesday night. Layers and layers and layers of grief. We feel it in our bones. So here's what I want to say to you, and it's what Peter got to in his sermon. God will show up. I promise you. Maybe even God has shown up for you already. Maybe not on your schedule, but God will show up. Those women and men gathered in that room were pretty sure they had lost everything that they once thought they believed, that they had left home and family, mo- and family for those years before. Jesus was alive. Great, but he was there and then he was gone. And then God, the Holy Spirit, showed up and created possibilities that they couldn't dream of on their own. So, Be kind to yourself, truly. Cut yourself a little slack. Be as kind as you can be to folks around you, too. Even folks you may not be inclined to be as gracious to. Everybody is fighting a battle we can't see. Breathe. And know. While you can't predict it, And you sure can't make God show up in the way you want and on the time schedule you prefer. You are not alone. God is going to show up. I promise you. That is the promise of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is alive in the church and in the world. God is going to show up. And that is good, good news. All praise be to God. Amen.
In response to God's word for us, please join me as we say what we believe, using the words displayed on the screen and in today's bulletin, from the Hispanic Creed, El Credo Hispano. Creemos en el Espíritu Santo, por quien el Dios encarnado en Jesucristo se hace presente en nuestro pueblo y nuestra cultura. Por quien el Dios creador de todo cuanto existe nos da poder para ser nuevas criaturas. Quien con sus infinitos dones nos hace un solo pueblo, el cuerpo de Jesucristo. Creemos en la iglesia, que es universal porque es señal del reino venidero que es más fiel mientras más se viste de colores, donde todos los colores pintan un mismo paisaje, donde todos los idiomas cantan una misma alabanza. Creemos en el reino venidero, día de la gran fiesta, cuando todos los colores de la creación se unirán en un arco iris de armonía, cuando todos los pueblos de la tierra se unirán en un banquete de alegría, cuando todas las lenguas del universo se unirán en un coro de alabanza. Y porque creemos, nos comprometemos a creer por los que no creen, a amar por los que no aman, a soñar por los que no sueñan, hasta que lo que esperamos se torne realidad. Amén. Please join me now in a time of prayer together. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, whose breath this Pentecost Sunday comes blowing hard and violent as a tornado in springtime, hot and fiery as a California summer fire, and yet whose impact could not be more opposite. For you calm heaven's breath with language that knits us together into an everlasting community of belovedness. You come with visions and dreams that rain down on us beautiful and gentle, allowing everyone from male to female, from young to old, even those enslaved by systems and prejudices and powers that have seemed impossible to break, to become free. Free from worn out roles that serve no true purpose, free to embrace a life that is not determined by death, free to let in and to love with the love of Jesus Christ all that is good and whole and life-giving. For this, we bless you, great uniting spirit. For this, we give you thanks and we sing our praises and stand in humble awe. Spirit of health and wholeness, we pray today for those who have not yet heard the words of life in a language that they can understand, words that would bring to them a world of new beginnings. We think especially of those who wait to know the results of a medical test. Those who wait to know if they have passed the requirements of their career field. Those who are straining to hear the words of love and care from a partner or a parent or a child or a friend or even a stranger. that They have always longed to hear. Spirit whose power calls leaders and protesters, community organizers and peacemakers to speak of justice that reconciles and heals, we pray for all in need of your strength to go on against the discouraging tide of complacency, the inertia of things as they have always been, the limits of human compassion and common good sense. We pray this day especially for the peace of Israel, for the peace of Palestine, and for the peace of Elizabeth City. Blow on us anew this day, O Spirit. With courageous winds, blow away that which would hold us to the confines of our individual homes where a virus, a virus has made us content with a world only as big as our computer screens and people only in our own household into a larger world. Do not let us throw caution to the wind, Lord, but also do not let us avoid a world that you do not avoid. Do not let us avoid the world you have loved, Jesus, a world populated by so many interesting and curious people, a world you risked even death to redeem. And now, O Spirit, who knows our every sigh and groan, 
Hear us as together we speak in one voice the prayer Jesus said we all need to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. And now for our offering. The Holy Spirit comes to make our world bigger. The Holy Spirit comes to make our world more beautiful, more glorious, more blessed, more whole. Let us come to our discipline of giving this morning with all this in mind. Let us bring to God the gifts of our life and our labor so that they might create a bigger world of Christ's love and mercy. This morning, if you have gifts for the work and ministry of Westminster Presbyterian Church, I invite you to use our donate button, which is on our website, or to put a check in the mail. But however you do it, take some time this week to think about what you will give to God's world. Let us pray. God of mercy, we give you thanks for all that your bounty creates. The gifts we bring today acknowledge our thanksgiving. Use them like wind, like fire, to bring your world together in love. Amen and amen. All right. Friends, in the midst of the pandemic of grief in our world and that we all feel in its own ways, layer upon layer upon layer and the confusion and complexity and yes and no and back and forth and still nothing makes sense. God is going to show up. I promise you that. Maybe even God has shown up for you as of late. So I'd love for you to tell me about it. But the spirit is loose whether it is at a congregational meeting, literally right after this where we see each other, the gift of people who have said, you know, I think I feel called to serve in the next season of the life of this church. That is always a gift. Um, but for the countless ways, large and small, that people show up for each other, that you reach out to those in the community and beyond. The Spirit is alive and loose in the church and in the world. Pay attention. Be on the lookout. And know that as you go, as you seek to live and love and serve and catch up to whatever the Spirit is doing, know that it's good news that we don't go to figure this out by ourselves. We can know, never forget that the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God and the friendship and fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with each of us, with each of you, every step of that journey. And all God's people say together, Amen.